and I guess we're ready to go live here. Uh, this is Frank Bell, your host and uh, Snowflake Data Superhero for this Data Ops Unfiltered uh, webinar that we're starting off. And this week, I'm really excited because uh, his uh, title goes by, um, he's a field CTO, uh, global field CTO, principal architect for data engineering, Jeremiah Hansen here. But I also call him like the godfather of Snowflake CICD. So he's going to really, we're going to dig into pre-production, some of the most important decisions that you make with a Snowflake account and how you can do it better with data ops. And also joined with Jeremiah and myself, Frank Bell, uh, Snowflake Data Superhero, is another superhero, Guy Adams, who's the CTO of data ops. Uh, Jeremiah, you just want to um, introduce yourself briefly and then Guy, go after him. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. I'm excited to be here with you all. So Jeremiah Henson, I'm on our global field CTO team at Snowflake, um, where I lead the data engineering and data lake workloads. So I spend a lot of time with customers on, you know, development, best practices and DevOps. And so excited to talk about this issue, this particular point of kind of DevOps with you about environment management. And excited to be here with Guy as well. Hey, Guy, you want to just give a quick introduction? Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, so, yeah, Guy, I'm CTO at DataOps at Live. I won't give my my sort of the, the, the long history because I think people have heard it. But I think the interesting topic here is a lot of people have heard me describe kind of my background from software development and moving into data and uh, you know, DevOps to DataOps and saying, a lot of things are the same, and there's a lot of commonality between the two, and some of the things are different. I think this is a really good example of some of the things that are different, because if I'm a, a software developer and I'm building a mobile application or web application, the amount of state, the amount of data that I need to test and run that locally is typically trivial. You know, if I'm testing a, you know, I'm building an e-commerce site, I might have a little script that loads 10 sample products in so I can test check out and things like that. But the management of state is a relatively simple problem in the software world, whereas we come to the data world, I'm trying to build, for example, analytical workloads. I'm trying to build, you know, streamlit applications on top of, you know, data. It doesn't work without data. And it doesn't work without a really serious amount of data. You know, sticking in 10, 20, 30, 40 rows to develop against just isn't going to cut it. Um, first of all, because probably I can't generate my analytical workloads correctly. And secondly, we've got to build these things to be performant. You know, it's, it's, it's not hard to write a SQL query that's performant against, you know, 40 rows. Um, it's much harder to write a SQL query that's performant against, you know, 40 billion rows. So it's not just a functional side of it, it's also a performance side of it. So this whole issue of how do we manage state, how do we manage the data that we then need to develop against, you know, in our development environments and our feature branch environments to test against in our in our in our dev, in our pre-prod and our QA environments is a critical problem. And it's one that's really unique to the data world. It has doesn't really have a, a parallel in the software world. Um, and that was one of the reasons why, you know, when I first came to the data world and saw Snowflake and Zero Copy Clone, it was like a light bulb for me because. It, it was one of the fundamental enabling technologies that allowed real true day drops to happen. Yeah. Thanks guy. That's great intro into this. And uh, just for our listeners here and viewers, I just want to make sure this episode, we're really excited because we're, we're going to go in depth and we're going to get some pretty unique information from Jeremiah who's really studied these aspects of it. But this is about managing pre-production environments like dev, test, et cetera, within Snowflake and some of the main decisions you have to think about. So these are critical decisions that impact, you know, whether you go with one account or multiple accounts throughout the lifetime of your Snowflake journey. And we're just going to dig into really some of uh, really interesting aspects and some of the you know, pros and cons with different approaches associated with these pre-production environments. So with that intro, I'm going to give it over to Jeremiah and let him take it away with uh, building our groundwork for some of these decisions and how it works in Snowflake. Perfect. All right. Let me share my screen here and then we'll jump right into it. All right. So yeah, like Frank mentioned, I want to run through and talk about, start with the environments, like kind of what are they? Um, we'll talk about in Snowflake, some considerations, and then two main mechanisms that we'll go through cloning and our data sharing mechanism for how to seed a pre-production environment. So that's kind of what we'll run through quickly. Um, first, so to start with environments, right? You have production environment. Everybody's got a production environment. This is where 
anytime you have a system that you're sharing with users, that's your production environment. Um, now, it's a best practice in data engineering uh, and software engineering in general, of course. Can you, sorry about that. My screen just, you still see my screen? Yeah, it says environments. It just says the prod. Okay. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so with the production environment, of course, you don't want to make changes directly in production. And this is something that I think we probably all have done at some point in our career uh, is actually changed, you know, deployed a change or made a fix right in production. Uh, and sometimes that could be detrimental. But so I love this meme, the Dos Equis guy, right? About testing in production. <laughs> We, the, the best practice here is that you need pre-production environments. So you need to have a number of them. And the num the names vary between, I've seen so many different names over, over the years with customers and how they divide it up. Um, and this is showing three you know, pre-production environments. There could be two, there could be five, um, there can be integration test environments. So there can be a lot of different pre-production environments. But the idea is to validate the changes that you're making in a pre-production environment or series of them before you release them to production, right? That's the whole point. And so we'll go through and talk a little bit more now about kind of how that looks in Snowflake. So for Snowflake customers, um, you'll be familiar with this, but if you're, if you're not, Snowflake has a concept of an account and that's kind of your main unit um, of managing objects. And you have an account per region. And when it comes to environments, you can decide do you have multiple, like, do you have your pre-production environments and your production environment in the same account, or do you have them in separate accounts? And this is a really important decision to make. Um, and I'll go through in the next slide and show some of the, the considerations, but this decision is, there's a lot of things that go into this. And as I work with customers on this, you know, it can be, sometimes it's dictated by their infosec teams, their, you know, security teams say you have to go one way or the other. Uh, usually it's you have to go with multiple accounts, but it just depends. So you have to go through the process of, you know, considering the two and then weighing in from the, get, getting way in from your InfoSec team. But just to show you here, the, the idea you have on the left, the, what I call many to the many to one, many environments per Snowflake account, per single Snowflake account. And in this case, we're seeing pre-prod. So this could be any number of them. This is maybe a dev environment along with your pr production environment in the same account. Okay, so that's one model. The other is essentially one environment per account. So it's kind of the one-to-one -one model. So each account in Snowflake represents an environment. And of course you can even mix these, like so we could have you know, one account with multiple pre-prod environments and another with a single production. So but that gives you the idea. This slide I won't, this is like this, the ugliest slide maybe ever made. Um, I'm not going to read through it, but since this is recorded, you'll be able to go back and look at this. But this shows some considerations, uh, kind of technical differences between the two approaches. So as you go through them, everything from how you seed the, the environment, how you copy the data, and that I'll dig into. Um, but just different things around the naming and testing behavior changes and things like that. So there are a few considerations to weigh, you know, to help in this decision making process. So I want to talk now about how to create that, how to create an environment, some best practices, and then go through that whole, what I, what I called on that previous slide, a, an approach to how you see the environment or how you copy data between them. So the, if I had to boil it down to say three steps, uh, the first is to build the environment. And this is what we'll spend a little more time going through, but it's important to understand like the second step here around protecting it. So this is another area where you have to go through and talk to your information security team and understand the requirements. Um, I've worked with many customers over the years um, and this varies. So the idea is what, from your production data, what of that data can exist in a pre-production environment? And in some companies I've been at, the, given the data they had and given their requirements, we, we could have all the, pr the production data in a pre-production environment. So that was one extreme. But then I've also worked with customers where you could have no production data at all in a pre-production environment. It had to all be synthetically generated. Uh, and that has all challenges all by itself, of course, but, and there's anything in between. And so the idea here with the step two is you have to apply whatever uh, policies your company has, your organization has. So that could be um, obfuscating the PII data. That's an, a generally an, um, kind of a standard one. Sometimes it's actually removing it entirely. Like they can't, you can't even have it there, even if it's obfuscated. 
but using Snowflake features like uh, row access policies and column masking, you know, applying some of those um, policies can help basically protect the PII and sensitive data. So whatever this looks like, there's a number of different ways to do it, but you're going to protect the data first. And then only after you have a copy of your data, you've, you've got your environment set up, you protected it, do you grant access to it? And that's an important also consideration. I've also seen situations where customers <laughs> forget that step. Maybe maybe the permissions are already there when they do the copying of it. And so customer, you know, their users have access to it uh, and that can be bad. So this is these three steps are important to kind of keep straight. Just on that, just on that point too, Jeremiah, the, the protect. I think one thing that's really useful to to understand here, particularly with um, dynamic masking, is the the way that you can use some of the dynamic masking functions. Like I'm thinking about, um, you know, checksums, MD5 checksums, things like that. Because what it what it does is allow you to, particularly if the thing that you're masking is a, a typical join field, because you can't just replace. You know, it's it's easy to go through and replace it with any old junk, but uh, all of a sudden from an analytical perspective, well, now I can't join, you know, my customer table onto my address table onto my orders table because those keys are gone. Whereas if you use, a, you know, MD5 sum or something like that, you can remove the PII, but still maintain the joinability of those data sets. And that's really, really important for creating a clean, safe, but still useful data set for, for developers. Yeah, absolutely. And, there, and there's so much that goes into all of this, of course, like how you do your keys, you know, so, so, so a lot of customers use synthetic keys, which are different, of course, than like a key that has meaning in it. Sometimes the keys actually have sensitive data in them. And so even more important, you know, to your point guy, like, so yeah, that's a great point as well. So that protection step is, is important and it does depend on, you have to kind of look at your particular environment and requirements and um, come up with what that looks like. So in order, when we talk about this, um, kind of that first step here of building the environment. This is, and I often refer to this as seeding an environment. So if you have a pre-production environment, you need to seed that with production data. Um, and so to do that, there's really two approaches. The first is cloning. And this is a really, a guy talked about this at the beginning. This is a really important capability within Snowflake. And essentially we call it, we all refer to this as zero copy cloning. And I'm gonna explain why and how this works briefly. Um, but this is essentially a copy of it uh, can be everything from a single object like a table to an entire database. It's a copy of it that initially is zero, it takes up no more storage. So it's zero copy. And the way this works, let me just walk through this with a simple diagram. Imagine you have a table, A1. Um, the way this, you know, in, in there's three layers here. There's the global services layer in Snowflake, which is our really the brains of Snowflake. This is what keeps track of all the, does enforces governance and security handles a lot of performance optimizations, query planning, all that. Also tracks all the metadata. So it's the meta store for Snowflake. And in this case, the table, the global services layer tracks that table A1 uh, has a certain schema and essentially is made up of a number of files in storage. And we call these in Snowflake micro partitions. Those are each individual file that makes up, that has all your data that makes up the table. And what happens with cloning, with zero copy cloning is we can actually make a copy of that table by just copying metadata. And so what we do is create that metadata here and it actually initially points to the same set of files. And this is why it's called zero copy. So we actually have another object and this, imagine this is, imagine A1 is a production table and A2 is a development table or something in a pre-production environment. The idea is you can create that copy that's a, um, initially takes up no additional storage but the key thing to keep in mind when I talk to customers about this, sometimes what comes to mind initially is that, you know, now if I make a change to this environment it's good, or this table, it's going to affect the original one. And that is not the case. What happens is, say I make a change to my, say this is development, and I make a change to it. Well, what happens is, so say I change one of these particular files. In this case, say I changed, I made a change, I updated a record, maybe I obfuscated some data, like we talked about. Um, what will happen is we'll create a new file with that new, that changed data. And this table will now point to that new file and no longer to this existing one. But the previous table will still point to that because it hasn't been changed. And so that kind of shows you conceptually or visually how this works, um, but a really powerful feature that customers can use for doing this. Now, the, the thing that I need to point out that's really important is that cloning is a capability that exists within the same account. 
So if you remember back, let me just flip back. If you go remember back to the diagram here, uh, I talked about these these two approaches that you have multiple envi account environments in one account or an environment per account. Well, cloning only works in this model here where you have multiple environments in the same account because cloning only happens within an account. So make sure that, you know, that's, and I put that on this really wordy slide. Uh, it's this first line up here that you can see as well. So important to understand. So for, and this is kind of the default starting point that I recommend for customers is to start with one account um, with multiple environments. But like I said, a lot of times you're driven from either security requirements or whatever to multiple accounts. So you're probably super excited. Like we talked about, you know, Guy mentioned it, we talked about cloning. This is an awesome feature, but what if you're in multiple accounts? Like what if you can't take advantage of this capability? I want to end this little first part by just going through how, uh, how you might do that and how customers do that. Um, and then I guess before that really quick cloning cautions, I mentioned the first one already with multiple Snowflake accounts, this doesn't work. Um, the other thing about cloning that's important to keep in mind is that it's not instant. Uh, it's very fast and it's way faster than what we used to deal with, with backup and restores. I don't know how many folks are kind of come from the traditional data engineering world and where we actually did backups and restores. I mean, that just took, it took days to do restores. Like it was super time consuming where this is still very fast. It can be minutes to, you know, hours to do depending, but it depends on the number of objects you have. It depends on the, the number of tables and the number and the, the size of the tables, um, how long this takes because we're copying that metadata. And so it does take, it's not instant is the point. And then you have to be careful too, when you're doing cloning, if you have a view, for example, that points that joins some tables, maybe in different schemas or different databases, when you clone that view, when that view is cloned, it will actually still point to the original, ob you know, definitions, the original objects. And so that might not be correct if you're creating, say, a pre-production environment. So you need to basically deploy changes to those objects um, with the updated code. And that's where you get into things like database change management. So tools like um, Terraform or in DataOps Live, the Sol tool. Is that the correct um, mm -hmm. term? Yeah, Sol. Uh, and that's the way to manage these objects and be able to deploy that in different environments. So keep that in mind as you go through. I think that that, that last point is one that I see customers really kind of forgetting about because everyone focuses on oh my god there's loads and loads of data how do we create a copy of the data and then they see zero copy clone and they go phew we're done it's like no 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 no. you've solved the biggest problem but actually there are significant numbers and the way i the way i encourage people to think about exactly like you've got in this last bullet point is think about that that development environment that ephemeral environment think about it as you are building a new one from you know using all of your infrastructure as code and everything else just you're starting with the data but everything that you're putting on top of that your roles your permissions your virtual warehouses your spots your views all of the non data carrying things that you're sticking on top of that don't rely on them coming across with a clone actually plan to rebuild them in situ with all of the relevant links and cross relationships so that what you end up with is this if in this sort of non prod environment is a completely internally consistent thing that looks and feels and smells like production, but it is completely internally consistent within itself. And that's a yes. that's quite a challenge. And yes, a and it, it, I mean, it's a super good point. It is. And it really like this can get, of course, as you imagine, this can definitely um, be complex depending on your environment, but because sometimes customers will just clone uh, specific tables and then they'll deploy their objects through like a database change management kind of method. So uh, definitely very um, kind of gets nuanced, but this gives you the, at least the things to be considered or to keep in mind as you're going through it. Okay, so the last slide I want to show is, um, and again, this is there's a lot on this slide. It's going to be recorded, um, so you can see this. But this is showing essentially how I mentioned when you have multiple accounts in Snowflake that you can't use cloning um, because cloning can't go across account. So the idea here is we still need to have pre-production environments, right? Remember the Dosecki's guy? Like we're not going to test in production. We got to do this. So this approach is one is a, a good way to do it and it's still much easier than the alternative um, which i'll describe so imagine you've got on the left your production snowflake account and imagine on the right you've got a pre-production account and so i'm if you remember back i talked about this that you could have the idea could be in this pre-production account you could have dev you know test stage all within one account but it's all pre-production and so this that's what we're showing here and the idea is in your production account, you've got your live databases with your PII. So this is a pattern that's 
common with customers is what you would do is within that product count, you could clone it. You could then take this database and do that. We remember the three steps. We created the environment, then we protected it. And this is a big part of that protection is you could then here either remove the PII. Um, you could create uh, governance policies within Snowflake to protect it in various ways. And then the idea is you use data sharing. So this is a really powerful Snowflake feature where between Snowflake accounts, we can share data real time in place. So it's not a copy of the data. It's actually, as soon as I make a change here to this, this database, it's reflected in this shared database on the, any other account. Um, but shared databases are read only. And so what you do is you have to create a copy and that's what this number five, the CTAS is. So this is uh, create table as select. And the idea is we're creating a copy then of that shared database into a database now that exists in our pre-production account that's that can you can write to. And this now can become the source for seeding your all your pre-production environments. So say you had dev, test, and stage. Well, you can do a clone then to each of those environments from this, this single copy. And that's the idea. And that's this pattern, like I said, is very, uh, very common pattern and is still, you know, even though you can't use cloning, which is obviously, you know, a few extra steps involved, it's still much faster than the alternatives of like we used to do with backup and restore, but also with doing a full copy um, between accounts or unloading the data and reloading. All that is takes way more time than this approach. So, all right. So that's the end of kind of my overview. And then I think we have the fun part now of seeing how data ops live can really help make some of these things like much easier and automate them as well as some of these principles that we've covered. So let me stop sharing. Thank you. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep this, this piece pretty brief. We do have one question, by the way, um, Gemma, I, about zero copy clone does it require a warehouse i believe it's a cloud services operation so it doesn't require a, a running warehouse is that right yeah i believe that is correct i'm trying to think back that to, is correct to, but I, yeah that's, that's right. correct Good. okay um so yeah just wanted to cut yeah bring bring a, a the, the day shots perspective to this and and you know what you know, couldn't agree with more with everything Jeremiah said. In particular, I think that's the, that's the best uh, illustration explanation of zero copy cloning I've ever seen. Um, so yeah, I might I might have to borrow some of those slides. Um, so the way that we do this in Datrops is kind of take take that underlying um, primitive that that zero copy clone and then build kind of an environment management system on top of it. And and the way that we think about things is there's two types of environment. There are a long lived environment. So typically production is obviously long lived, usually QA and probably an integration environment like dev is, is long lived. But then we've got potentially tens, hundreds of engineers developing hundreds or thousands of features. And we want every one of those to have their own sandbox. So you know, this the concept of an ephemeral feature branch environment is, is really critical to data ops. It just says, look, I, I'm making a change. I want my own sandbox to develop it, test it, play about with it. I might only have it for an hour or I might have it for a week. It doesn't matter. You know, and that's one of the, the you know, that what Jeremiah was saying that, you know, that zero cost for creating that copy is so important because, you know, you couldn't do that you know, across thousands and thousands of features if there was a, a material cost to it. So the fact that I can stand this up for essentially for free and pay a very, very small amount just for the modifications I'm making and then an hour later destroy it um, is, is a really critical part of this. The, the, from, from from my perspective, if I look across like the, the next level down of complexity because everybody says, you know, this level one is I need to get a copy of my data. Right, zero copy cloning, got it. Level two is what we just talked about, which is, hey, turns out that's not enough. I've got to deal with repointing of my views and my role structure and things like that. Okay, great. Now, now I've done that. Then we get to this third level of complexity, and this is typically for larger customers, and it boils down to two separate pieces. There's the what and there's the how. And and the what, you know, so far, as, as kind of Jeremiah's described, you know, the what is production data or some version of production data. But we're starting to see all sorts of variants of this. So it could be full production data. It could be full production data with PII mast. If I've got petabytes of data, it may not make sense to, you know, zero copy clone is fast and is cheap, but it's not instant. And if I've got a petabyte of data across a thousand tables and I'm just trying to fix a typo, it probably doesn't make sense to do zero copy clone of, you know, thousands and thousands of tables, of, you know, across a petabyte database. So maybe I have a version of this, which is only 10% of production or 5% of production, or maybe it's only in a situation where I've got, you know, one database and I've got a thousand schemas representing data products. If I'm working on a data product that only hits three of those schemas, it probably doesn't make sense to clone the 997 schemas that have got nothing to do with it. So at that point, I might be a little bit more selective about what I, about what I clone. So 
we're seeing people do more and more and more work on saying, you know what, full production is still the default for most people, but people are getting more and more sophisticated about saying, I'm going to create multiple dev data sources. Um, and the other thing that you know that's starting to come up, and there are tools out there now that, that do this really nicely, is create synthetic data, but synthetic data that really has the look and feel of production data. And I've seen some really exciting work coming out where it will actually scan your production data and then say, I'm going to create something that's totally synthetic that you can take anywhere, but it looks and feels and smells and has the same distribution and balance as your production data and therefore should be good enough for analytical development purposes. And you know, we start to see the first customers build that into the pipeline and says, hey, once a week, we'll scan our production data, we'll make a truly synthetic set, then we'll use that as our development source for, for X, Y, Z. So a lot of really interesting things about what you what you know, what you use, and then and this is kind of you know similar to to the slides that Jeremiah showed. You know, this question is is how you use it. So single tenant, you know, this is just a a diagrammatic version of of you know pretty much what Jeremiah said. You know, but building in the the, the fact that I may not necessarily go straight from the prod DB straight to my clones. I may have a a step in the middle. It is creating other development sources from that. It may be a sample. It may be a create the first hundred rows. It may be a create synthetic data. But the principles are exactly the same. You create those sources from your production data, and then you use one or more of those sources for your for your zero copy clone. When we when we move to the multiple account, um, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. So if you look at the left hand side, uh, when I use replicate here, it, I don't necessarily strictly mean the replicate functionality, the replicate could be exactly what Jeremiah described, which is a, a share and then a local materialization through a, through a CTAS. Um, but it's the same principle. It's taking a production data source and either I bring the entire thing into my non-production tenant and then I can break it down into these various versions and then I can use those for, for different um, data products or data projects. Or I can do that and probably the second option I'd say is more is more prevalent because in this case, particularly if you've got sensitive data, um, you're doing the desensitization on the production tenant. So if you look at the left-hand example, I'm taking sensitive data into non-production and then desensitizing it, which some security officers will allow somewhere. In the right-hand option, I'm saying, you know, I will take a copy of production data, I will desensitize it, and only the desensitized version goes into the non-production tenant. So that's that's one of the differences between these two approaches. And then the final thing to say is, you know, both Jeremiah, Jeremiah and I have discussed this in the concept of two tenants. It doesn't have to be two. It can be three or four or five or six. You know, it's the, 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 the problem to solve is N greater than one. But you can have, you know, your production tenant, your QA, your dev. You can have this engineering team, you know, has their feature branch environments in this Snowflake account. Those ones have those are there. You can do it regionally. So you can get almost any level of complexity if you really want to. 100% agree with, with Jeremiah's approach. Keep it simple to start with. You know, if you can keep it in one account, add more as you need to. Only add that complexity when you determine that you absolutely need it. Don't start off with six or seven or eight accounts and build a complicated plumbing mesh between them because it's, you know, a non-trivial amount of work. You know, even with DataOps to automate all of this, number one and number two, you probably find you won't need most of it anyway. So I would say, you know, start out simple, use the you know, use the primitives that are built in, use the DataOps capabilities on top, and then expand out to more complicated topologies when you have a real good business reason to do so. Thanks, Guy. That was really good. And thanks, Jeremiah, for laying out kind of the decisions and, pro and challenges and what, which ways you have to decide. So we only got a couple more minutes left. But just to um, summarize it, maybe it's to Guy, like the thing that I'm excited about with this is, is just how this makes this more methodical once you make those decisions. And even if you're using multiple accounts, which is harder to when you don't have the cloning at first and have to do C pass or persistence of the data. Uh, can you just give examples of Roche or some of the other customers? Like, because this is, when you get this set up right, it's kind of a game changer from a, you know, efficiency standpoint, right? Yeah, and, and I think the, the critical thing to understand here is that, you know, first of all, you know, if you're, if you're setting this up, you're not setting it up from scratch, you know, you're setting it up on top of what Datrops has built, which is sitting on top of what Snowflake has built. So, you know, all the heavy lifting has been done, has been done for you, number one. And number two, one person sets this up once for a company. You know, you've got 5,000 engineers building data products across multiple environments. One person set up the way that that works, the way those different data sources are created. The way that, So, you know, it's a, I wouldn't say it's it's 100% trivial, but one person does it with support and then the entire organization benefits from it. So the the benefits you get as compared to the enormous, you know, the enormous benefits as compared to the fairly minor setup costs are, are you know, absolutely huge. 
Yeah, I mean, this just takes things from where we built these things when they weren't available and products like DataOps Live and Snowflake from, you know, custom coded mechanisms that had a lot of maintenance to more formulaic templated approach that helps with efficiency, but also with data governance as well. So, I mean, Please. this is an amazing solution because it just makes it easier for your data engineering team. Just to add one final thing, because everything we've talked about so far has been how I create these things. Let's not forget that everything's got to be life cycled. Everything I create as an environment exactly. at some point has to go away. Um, so we need to think about the life cycle of how do I clean this up automatically when I finished? Because, you know, yeah, that, you know, those, those zero copy clones won't cost me very much. But if I leave them sitting around for years and years, that soon racks up, especially if we've got thousands of them. So, you know, you need to have just as much rigor about cleaning this stuff up automatically when you finish with it as you do about creating it automatically in the first place. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think we're out of time. Unless you guys had something else, uh, we're just going to wrap this up now. Uh, any last words or anything else you guys want to add? No, I, I mean, I, I guess the one thing on my part, just I know we didn't get to see it in action today, but the automation that's built into data ops for doing this, for doing the cloning and things is awesome. And I think that's the, you know, you can write scripts and you can do all this, but that's a lot of work. And I think, you know, the, having that just baked into the product uh, is cool. So check that out if you haven't seen that. Yeah, Basically. the fact that that's templated and built in just makes things so much easier. Well, thanks for everybody joining us and uh, catch us in another two weeks for the next Data Ops uh, Unfiltered. And thank you both, especially Jeremiah and Guy, for joining me this week. And uh, have a good week, everybody. Thanks, everyone.